All right, hey YouTube guys. Uh, today I'm gonna do a tutorial on basically something that happened to me today that really tested my student pilot experience. Um, in aviation, we have something called aeronautical decision making. It's where you know the process through which a pilot goes through to make decisions. So I'm just gonna cut to the chase. So basically, I'm working on doing my last. Um, solo requirement which is a long cross country and this one requires me to go to an airport no less than 50 miles away from the departure point and um on my and i need to do at least i need to land to a, at, at another airport so the first solo was go to point a and come back but with this one you're gonna go to one airport and then land at another airport so a total of three takeoff three landings that i'm supposed to do so my school flies out of montgomery airport which is this one right here as you guys can see and um as you for those who know a little about aviation it's a delta airspace so see there's a dot blue uh segmented line i mean yeah blue segmented and it's from the surface to 2,900. So that's the Delta airspace. So this is where my airport is at. When you go to the airport diagram, uh, basically this is what it looks like. We have 28 left, 28 right. And the field elevation is 427 feet. I'm parked over by Gibbs somewhere in this vicinity right here. So you know my plane will be here on the ramp and so they're gonna they usually taxi me via juliet hotel alpha and this is the run-up area where i will check my engines make sure you know all my magnetos and everything is working so something happened to me uh this morning which you know i was really tested and i pretty much made the right decision so i want to give you guys a tutorial on what it takes to prepare for a flight especially a cross-country flight so basically we're going to use the um we're going to use the acronym uh nw craft according to the federal aviation regulations aim um 91103 and if we just to uh, google that right now so nw craft that's the acronym that we we have to use um so when you you know click on the first link right here let's see what they show nw craft click on that all right so okay here's the definition so we need to know notums we need to get the weather uh go back why don't you get it so we need to know the NOTAMs, W is for weather, K is for known ATC delays, we need to know the runway length, we need to have an alternate available, we need fuel requirement, and we need takeoff and landing distances, right? And it's CFR 91103. It's required for pre-flight preparation. So we would go to get notice, and this is like notices to airmen, right? And basically you want to know what's happening at the airport. So my airport is Kilo Mike Yankee Fox Rat, that's out of Montgomery. So I'm gonna be putting in three airports and I need to know what's happening at my destination, which is Hemet. And um I'm gonna be landing here. So let me zoom out to show you guys the entire route. That's what it looks like. This is my long cross country. I'm gonna take off from here. And I'm going to go out to the east. I'm going to fly over uh, Gillespie Airport. My house is like right here in this vicinity. Then I'm going to go to this lake. And I'm going to go up to the northwest. Then I'm going to keep going up. And this is a uh, French Valley Morietta Airport. And um, then my destination will be here. After I land at this airport... I'm going to taxi back and then I'm going to come down, follow the same route um, like what I did when I was going up. Then I'm going to come and make a landing here and a takeoff. And then I'm going to basically, after I take off from here, I'm going to come over these waypoints again 
instead of going over this airport, I'm just going to kind of fly to the south here a little bit towards this waypoint and then back to Montgomery where my school is to park the airplane. So that's the entire route for the long cross country. When I did the first one, I just went from my school airport in Montgomery all the way up same route went over this delta airspace and then i continued all the way up and i landed in hemet did a u-turn and then i came back down through the same route and then i landed in montgomery and i was the first solar car it took me two hours um to complete that one right so back to our acronym notices the airmen that's what this means notices the airmen basically this is the newspaper for aviation you want to know what's happening at the airport you have to consult with the notices to the to airmen so we would go to fa.org i mean fa www.fa.gov and we would go over to regulations then notices to airmen and we're going to put in, uh, of course, you read this is a disclaimer, I agree. We're going to put over three airports, Kilo, Mike, Yankee, Fox Rat. We also want to know Kilo, Hotel, Mike, Tango, and Kilo, Romeo, November, Mike, right? So those are the three airports that we're going to be. This is departure. This is my first uh, arrival airport. And then this is my alternate as well as I'm going to land here as well. So we want to know what are the notices that has been issued um, to airmen who is going to be using these airports. So when we click view notems, um, so here Friday the 9th, March 2018, uh, March, 2000, March 9th, 2018, it gives you the time. So it says for departure airport, um, this is the date. And then Mike Yankee Fox for runway 10 left, precision approach path indicator, high intensity is out of service. So with this one, because I'm doing a day visual flight rules, uh, day flight, this would not affect me because I'm not using this in the night. This is for high intensity, it's out of service. So if you're coming in the night and you wanna turn the lights really bright to see the runway as you're coming in for that precision approach, uh, this would be this would not help you then there's an obstacle crane and this tells you it's a no 400 feet AGL it's not lighted so you want to bear that in mind and then here's one more there's an obstacle departure for the airport I'm not an instrument pilot so this is not applicable to me there's nothing for Hemet and there's nothing for Ramona except the AD approach all surface uh, I think they're doing some construction. That's what the guy told me this morning. They're doing construction on all surfaces. So you would come here first and you get all the notices to airmen. Then next, W stands for weather. So in our source, we're going to check for um, Aviation Weather Center. I've, I went ahead and basically what you want to do is put in all the airport codes that is issuing weather along the road so i've already put them in and i selected to get the TAF, which is telling me further on in the future what's happening so how i know which airport will help me to know what weather is going to be along my road i need to basically put the route in which i don't use sky vector i get my old chart charts hard copy and i get my plotter i get my e6b and i plot it myself but for the tutorial I'm showing you guys how this looks when I'm doing it on a paper chart. So Sky Vector just makes it a very convenient. I select my Kianke Factor at my departure airport and I want the San Diego terminal uh, chart. So when we look at our TAC, um, basically I'm just going to zoom in. So Montgomery Station, everything with a green is telling us um, that weather, they, 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 it's a weather station, right? So this gives us a time, it tells us what the winds are doing, the visibility and everything. The closest airport to give us a terminal aerodrome forecast, which is, you know, a forecast of what's happening on a 24-hour period or 30-hour period, it's Miramar, it's just north of Montgomery. So this is like maybe five six seven miles max and um 
we would put this one in so we have an idea. So notice when I put the cursor on this, it just tells me the current winds and the condition. So that's a meter. It's just temporary within an hour. Every hour it changes. This one no, gives me a broader, for, it gives me a, a, a forecast for, for a longer period of time. This one is good enough for 24 hours. So it tells you different times. If you look, you know, it breaks it down nicely. So this is for future reference. So when I go way up here and I want to have an idea what the weather is going to be like when I'm coming back. So I'm going to have to select Los Angeles because the this the first chart cuts off somewhere in this vicinity. I think right after here it cuts off. So I have to select the Los Angeles sectional that gives me a broader picture of what the rest of my route looks like, right? So the terminal aerodrome forecast for Miramar tells me what the future looks like. So it from here to here, it's a two hour flight. I mean, one hour and one hour going, one hour coming back. So I want to know what the weather is going to be like. Uh, that's not good. What the weather is going to be like over a two hour period. So I would come here and I would look on that. So anyways, what happened to me was I came on, I checked everything and, you know, for weather, I put in all the airport codes. It tells me what's happening. Winds were going to be favorable. Thing, everything looks nice. This is for San Diego International Airport, and don't worry about these. They're, they're crazy for you if you don't know what aviation and weather. But basically, uh, this tells me what my weather, is, what the uh, METARS and the terminal aerodrome forecast is doing. Not only do I want METARS, but I want to know what are the winds doing. I'm going to be cruising at 3,500 feet, so I need to know what the winds are doing. So I would come over to this portion of this chart, winds and temp data. There's two that I'm going to use. So I'm going to use San Diego Airport, which is winds are 320 at 11 knots. This morning when I was doing my flight planning, it was like 340 at 9 knots. And then I use the one for Ontario, which tells me this morning was light and variable at 3,000 feet. So in order to have an idea what the direction of wind and velocity is going to be like along my route, you would come here. And in my case, I use Ontario and I use San Diego. Now, San Diego, going back to this, the winds aloft would take me, I would use San Diego when I'm flying from here all the way until I reach French Valley. When I get to this point, I stop using San Diego's winds aloft and I begin to use Ontario's winds aloft. Uh, if we search far and wide, Ontario Airport should be... Uh, that's... Where's, where's Ontario again? No fuller. Uh, All right, so find that is easy. We just put K O N T, and we do like. Oh, okay, here it is, right here. Okay, so that's Ontario Airport. Okay. So not so it makes sense, right? If Ontario is here, then we can use Ontario's winds aloft to give us an idea what's going to be happening in this vicinity where the winds aloft is concerned. And this morning, in this area, winds were just light and variable, really calm and nice. Not nothing was, you know, projected or forecasted to be of any problems along my route. So I went and I got my winds and temp. Then the next thing I wanted to get is my prog chart. You know, what's happening on the prog chart? The prog chart, this one right here, basically it tells us like if there's IFR conditions or anything in red, which will tell us that the ceilings are less than 1,000 feet and visibility is less than 3 miles. This one blue is marginal VFR, so anything that has ceilings of 1,000 to 3,000 feet and visibility three to five statute miles, these are not nautical miles, they're in statute miles, we will mean that it's marginal VFR. So in this area, we see that it will tell us uh, moderate or greater turbulence. So if we look at this one right here, 
we will see that from the surface to 14,000 feet, it's moderate turbulence. That's what that little hat means, right? Moderate turbulence right in this vicinity. And this blue means there's marginal VFR up in San Francisco area, you know, keep going up north. Um, this blue line right here are green. I'm colorblind. This is blue. This is you know, light green. Freezing level above mean sea level. So 12,000 feet MSL we're going to have freezing level. What this means is if you were flying in this area and you see clouds, you would be picking up some ice because the temperatures are below freezing. But only if you fly in the clouds will you pick up ice. So if you don't see any clouds, which clouds means visible moisture, and you fly at 12,000 feet in this vicinity and you stay clear of the clouds, which you should because you're a VFR pilot, pilot um, you would not pick up any ice. So they, they're just telling you at this altitude, the temperatures are so cold that if you were to see clouds, um, you would basically pick, you would get ice on your wings. And in my airplane, we're not certified to fly in icing conditions. If we see any zigzag lines like this one here, it means that there's freezing level at the surface. So right here at the surface, anywhere in this vicinity, um, you would be picking up ice. So if there was any dew overnight on the airplane, frost, uh, those perhaps would get frozen on the wings and it would change the smooth flow of airflow and you could find yourself in some life-threatening situation because it's freezing from the airport. Before you even take off, it's already freezing. This is saying that it's at this altitude, it's freezing. But the, this one, it's from the surface even before you get airborne you're already um, having icing on your plane if there's any frost from overnight um, this is a 12 hour forecast and this is 24 hours so as you can see here you realize that this marginal VFR over a 24 hour period will come further inland the IFR conditions are over 24 pe 24 hour period will come into effect over the 24 period, but during the 12 hours, they're not expecting any instrument flight rules or IFR conditions, which is the one in red. So I, that's my prog chart. This helps me to know what the ceilings are, visibility, if there's any turbulence, if there's any freezing level, if there's any ice on the surface. And, you know, you can also get thunderstorms on, on this one, just using the prog chart as well. Next, I want to go to my standard briefing which I did that this morning. And when you look at the weather depiction chart, I'm gonna click the GIF. Now, this is not a forecast, it's an observation. So what this means is, this is a station, this is San Diego right here. So if we go back to Sky Vector, basically San Diego Airport, which is this one, right? It's saying that right now winds are Three zeros are at seven knots, 10 static miles is broken at 18,000, broken at 25,000 feet. If we go to our um, chart here, you see thing broken. That's what that, that means. It's broken at 25,000. So what they did with this chart is they take all the reporting station of what's happening currently and they just give you an idea of the entire thing. It's the weather depiction chart. So when I checked it this morning along my route, sky was just clear everywhere. Um, you have a cold front and it's dissipating right here. So this arrow showing us a cold front coming in. Um, we have all these symbols. Uh, this would be overcast at 2,400 feet. Overcast at 5,000. So the number underneath you would just add two zeros so that and give and that would tell it's 5,000. This is 1,900. There's a trough right here, and this is showing us a ridge, right? Um, this is snowing. The visibility is three quarter miles. You can only see a three quarter of a mile. It's overcast at 3,000, and it's from an automated station. So this is not good what's happening. When you see this happening with this 
broken line inside its IFR conditions and the white circles outside their marginal VFR condition. So you this is crucial because it helps you to have an idea of what's happening along your route if you're gonna have instrument conditions or VFR conditions. So I check that and next I go to my radar summary. This is where we pick up precipitation. So in this area um, this morning it was like 22,000 feet that the radar picked up some amount of moisture in there. So this is like green, rain, you know, light green, not so much. When you see yellow and red, red, you could be going through areas where there's lightning and all this stuff happening. This shows, this is showing us that uh, each branch right here is 10 knots. So this would be 20 knot wind and it's coming from the, uh, northwest northwesterly winds so whatever is going on here it's being blown in this direction right so as you can see down in my area they're not picking up any precipitation at all right and, um, yeah that's what i would do with that one so let me double check if i've gotten everything so i have my meter i have taf I have my surface analysis. No, I didn't. Let me check surface analysis. No, let's go back. Uh, instead of doing surface analysis, we're just gonna go forecast. I hit the prog chart again. And I looked at this one. Now we're gonna look at the surface plot right here. All right, so the surface analysis shows us like high pressure system. These are ones that they work basically um, clockwise downwards outward right and when you say a high pressure thin blue you're dealing with cold air sinking um, this will give you happy you know I like to mention it think about it like happy um, you're gonna have good visibility you're not gonna see much clouds but you got to prepare possibly you're gonna have clear air turbulence so you might have a bumpy flight you know but you're gonna have good visibility when there's a low pressure system coming in, that's when you have a killer, you know, this is like low visibility, precipitation, clouds, um, turbulent, no, you know, nice smooth air going, but you're gonna have some really poor vis. So as a VFR pilot, I don't like to see low pressure system moving in. Uh, these are isobars, they're basically um, lines of constant pressure so they they just connect them so one zero one six one zero one six one zero one six the closer they are to each other is the stronger the wind so if you come over here we see this low pressure system in this vicinity um you notice the isobars are really close to each other so that will tell you if you're flying in this area expect to have strong winds when they're dispersed like really far from each other relatively um, calm winds you're gonna have in this vicinity it also tells us if there's an, a cold front so anything with a blue triangle attached to it it's a cold front uh, look that up it will tell you exactly what's going on um, one thing I remember whenever this thing passes the winds always just picked up so basically when you deal with fronts they are uh, basically the lines between a massive air boundary line so between a warm front and a cold front you know you have lines so a cold front is basically fast moving cold massive air that's overtaken a warm front uh let me see if there's any warm front here this one red this is a warm front so this warm front means that it's taking it's replacing cold air when it's uh, stationary, like in this case, we have red here, blue, red, blue. It's stationary. It's not moving. We have both cold and warm hanging out in the same vicinity, and none of them is overtaking each other. Um, when you have a occluded front, it's basically, let me see, occluded. Okay, there's one little branch here that's occluded. So just think about occluded, like uh, cold, uh, cold front, two of them just sandwich a warm front and whatever is sandwich like this the warm just gonna rise and in, in you're gonna have bad weather happening in this this vicinity and if we were to go back to our surface analysis chart our weather depiction chart we would see a lot of stuff happening in this vicinity there's moisture in there 
Um, the winds are really strong coming out of the northwest. As we can see, the isobar is really close. And I showed you earlier on, we did see strong winds in that vicinity. So basically, that's just a snapshot of how to pick up you know, your weather and see all the charts, what they mean. There's a lot more to them. I don't want to flood you guys with the whole nine yards. Then I want to have an idea what the... Um, pilots are doing you know pilots they fly they tell us what's going on so kilo mike yankee fox right that's where i'm going to depart from and i want to know anyone encountered anything within a 200 mile radius when i checked it this morning there was a boeing 72737 that reported something at uh, 27,000 feet um there was a beechcraft 200 that reported something uh, i think they were flying around and they they were they were not having any turbulence so they reported no turbulence at a particular altitude um let's put in san diego and see if we get anything from them all right nothing from san diego all right let's do let's do jfk and see if we get any pilot report okay good so papa hotel lima you put that in sky vector and it will tell you exactly where is that vicinity all right uh it's not urgent that's why this means ua it's not urgent they were over the echo november echo sometimes it's a vor they were on the 270 radial and they were like seven miles all right uh the time was 0026 zulu and they were at ten thousand feet the type it's an embryo 1900 and it says turbulence occasionally moderate between 12,000 down to 10,000 so as they were descending from 12,000 to 10,000 there was a occasional turbulence and it was moderate um, this other person there uh, Papa Victor Delta um, they were over it they were on the uh, 360 radial and they were like 10 miles and the time was 0051 there were 6000 it's type it's a tbm 900 so it's a single engine uh land retractable gears of course high performance the temperature was minus 11 and they were picking up light rime ice so if you're in this vicinity and you're at 6,000 feet, then you want to factor in that you could be picking up light rime ice. This is the one that looks like little slush and just sticks onto your airplane and you can get in serious trouble with those rime ice, right? All ice is dangerous. So back to our acronym, we've covered weather, we've covered notices to airmen. Um, we, want, we want to know known ATC delays. We will go back to um fa.gov but sometimes that's a hassle so all i do is just go known atc delays just type that in google and see what search comes up all right first link here all right so for me known atc delays you want to have an idea are aircrafts delayed because there is traffic is it because of there's weather so I have San Diego Airport, when you put the cursor over, it says general arrival departure delays are 50 minutes or less. If I was going to fly up to LA, I would want to know what are what is causing delays in Los Angeles area. Um, when you click on each, we're going to click on San Diego. I'm going to make this screen big. General delays, traffic is experiencing gate hold and taxi delays lasting 50 minutes or less. General delay, general arrival delays because of arriving traffic is experiencing airborne delays of 15 minutes or less. So uh, delays by destination due to weather, wind, departure, traffic designed to Newark International Airport. New Jersey is currently experiencing delays averaging 47 minutes. So weather and winds at Newark. I'm not going to Newark in New Jersey. It's way over on the west, east coast. Um but i would have this would be a concern if i was in that vicinity weather winds i'm flying a small airplane uh and it's causing 47 minute delay uh that means you need to have way more fuel than you would anticipate because you can be in a situation where you're holding you're you have to wait so you want to bring extra fuel um if it's just stuff happening at the gate, people having a hard time getting, I'm not going into these big airports at Lingbird Tower. That's, I mean, Lingbird Airport, 
in San Diego International because I fly a very small plane. So this would not be a factor to me. But according to the regulations from the Federal Aviation Administration, they want you to know why, what's causing known air traffic control delays in the, along the route or the destination that you're going to fly. So that's the K. Okay, now we want runway length, right? Runway length. We want to know what is the length of the runways that we're going to be using. So when we click airport diagram here, I'm going to put this over to the side. Uh, 4,577 times 150. So all the length you can think of. Then I would go to my pilot operating handbook in the manual for the plane and I would calculate how much runway do I need based on the temperature, based on my weight. Um, this morning when I calculated, it's like I need 990, 998 feet to roll. And then if I'm clearing a 50 foot obstacle, it's like 1,977 feet. So I have 4,577 4, feet. Um, usually at Montgomery, by the time I start rolling from this little line here by, you know, sometimes due to the extra length attached to the airport that is used for just takeoff and taxi, but not for landing. Um, you, by the time I get to the numbers, I'm already airborne, you know? So this is like, I, I barely use for takeoff barely use any of the 4,755 feet of runway in length, you know. So you have to know the length. If we go to Hemet um, and we click on it, sometimes, okay, here we go, 4,314. So we know we have enough length, the 05 or runway 23. For Ramona, it's the same thing. If we go back to Sky Vector and we do right click, go on Ramona, airport diagram. Long runway. This is like over 5,001 feet in length. So we have all the runways we need. And that's what the um, R stands for. Alternate. We need to have an alternate. So in my case, basically an alternate is stated in 91103 states that any flight outside of the vicinity of an airport, you need to have an alternate. Even though it says, you know, IFR flight. I'm not an IFR, but I'm flying outside of the vicinity of this airport. So once I go with out like 20, 30 miles away from this airport, I need to have a way of what if I cannot make it back? Because this is a coastline. What if the marine layer hanging out on the coast, which we can see these clouds, you know, from the radar right here. Um, what if they creep over and they're just sitting over Montgomery? And I've seen that before. You want to make sure you have an alternate, alternative airport that you can land at. Maybe we can try Gillespie or maybe you can try Ramona, you know. So they're saying if you leave this airport and the weather was to change, you need to have a way that you can come back. Uh, I mean, you want to <laughs> you want to find an area that you can land in case you cannot make it back to where you departed from. So in my case, I'm going all the way up to um, Hemet. But in case after I leave here one hour later, something happens and the marine layer is blocking me from coming into London, Ramona, I mean, uh, Montgomery Field, I can choose, I chose Ramona as my alternate, right? So you have to have a flight plan stating if you come to your arrival airport and you're not able to land for any reason, what's your alternative route to go and land? Um, we could have tried Riverside. We could have gone over here, anything in this vicinity, which raises another question. How do we select an alternate? What makes a good alternate? Well, it wouldn't hurt if your alternate airport is controlled, meaning they have a control tower. So that helps you. you there's someone you can talk to that can help you. Um, if you look and there's like a cross attached to it, like a T, then we know there's fuel. The star on top of it means the airport is lighted. So if you're coming in and it's night, you can click on the light uh, and you can turn on those lights so the runway comes alive. You want to know um, in the vicinity of the airport, like if we were to click on it like this and we go Ramona, 
do they have fee will yeah service for so chances are they have repairs in this if your plane was to break they offer service they offer fuel that i use 100 low lead i don't fly jet fuel jet engine so i don't need jet but they have fuel that i use um the airport is attended from 1600 to four zulu so by nine o'clock um the tower is closed so if i'm operating that area which i was today then basically everything would be fine um if it's daytime because the the tower would be open and you know it tells you noise abatement procedure where air, which areas is sensitive and the time and communications to use what approach would you use if you're in this vicinity it's a class delta airspace so from surface to 2000 well in this case delta um i almost said surface to 2500 which technically is, is because if we trade the elevation and you subtract it from this, is you'll get like 2400 AGL, all right, height above the ground. So the blue here tells us it's a delta year space. It's from the surface to 3,799 because the minus 38 shows that it does not include 3,800 feet. So from the surface of the ground to through 3,799 is the tower you have to be in cons constant communication with the traffic with the um the tower in this vicinity so that's that's our um acronym that deals with runway length alternate fuel requirements we need to know how much fuel is it gonna take to fly from here all the way up to Hemet and back and include our alternate the requirement is when you're doing a day VFR flight, you should be able to fly from your destination to your arrival airport and have at least 30 minutes of fuel if it's the daytime. You need 45 minutes if it's night. At my school, you need to go from point A to point B plus your alternate and still have one hour of fuel to fly. So if you get ramp checked after landing at your destination and they put a fuel gauge in there or something to measure and they realize you can only fly for 20 minutes and it's the daytime your license can be in serious trouble because that would be an illegal it means you're pushing your plane to the limit and in case you were to delay or anything was to happen winds got stronger and it's taking you a longer time you would have basically found yourself in a situation where you run out of fuel last one is the t takeoff and landing distance you you would um for the the fuel requirements and your takeoff landing distance you would have to f consult with the pilot operating handbook i have a hard copy of it that i keep in my bag and that's what i use when i'm planning my flight right so basically that was a mouthful of what i did this morning and of course i called the weather briefer they said everything was gonna be okay visibility was gonna be good everything was gonna be nice but you know what happened? I took off and I'm gonna show you guys the um I'm gonna show you guys the video right now of what happened to me when I took off from the airport this morning. So I'm I'm on another screen. Give me a sec. I took off and when I climbed up I reached 1500 feet and before you know it, my visibility was not even um it was not even three static miles so i'm gonna pull up the video here in a few seconds it's just loading as it comes up <coughs> all right so i'm gonna drag this uh no 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 that's not the one that i need uh, this is the one that i need right so as you can see i'm in the run up area and um Tower is going to clear me. Of course, this nice little gadget belongs to my flight instructor. It, it, basically, what I just showed you, that's what I'm looking at. So, you know, I'm pause the video. Oh, yeah. Uh, my wife was on the phone. I was able to plug in my earbuds if you look in my ears um, i have the little white line coming here so i'm talking to her as you know my little co-pilot right. while i'm camera flying camera is go rolling all right adjust it all right 
So check final is clear. Runner is clear. So full power is in the green. Airspeed is alive. There's our fifty five knots. And we have lift off. We have blind. And we have birds. I just passed a hawk. Alright, so I'm just climbing out right now um, from the airport basically. Watch your runway track. Looking back, making sure I stay on runway track because there's two runways, so you don't want to drift to the left or right, especially to the left because other, another aircraft could be taken off. So now, if you can see, I'm going to pause the video right here. Um, if you look in this, this is the coastline of San Diego. Um, for those who are from California or San Diego specifically, the cross is right over here, Mount Soledad is in this vicinity. And as you can see, this layer of cloud is just sitting over here. So you wouldn't want to go anywhere near the west right now. My heading is showing I'm on a westerly heading, but I'm going to take a turn and come around in this area. So if I may bring up back this chart and show you guys what that actually looks like so i'm gonna do san diego talk i'm gonna just zoom in so uh, you guys can have an idea um this is my route right let just let that load a little bit so cows mountain is my first waypoint and basically what i'm doing is i take off from two eight left then i'm gonna climb and when i reach like 1100 feet i'm gonna make a right turn to now fly parallel to the runway. This would be a right downwind leg because the runway is on my right hand side and it's downwind because I'm now flying parallel to the, the runway I just departed from. Um, this blue line is to secure this. This is an um, this airport belongs to the military, so I'm not allowed to fly in it. It's a Bravo airspace. We're busy. I'm not allowed to fly in it. So when I take off out of Montgomery and I make the first right turn here, I quickly level the wings and make another right turn to make sure I'm south of this blue line because from the surface to 3,200 feet and between 4,800 to 10,000 feet, you need to have clearance to fly in this vicinity because maybe an F-16 will come hunt you down and you don't want to have that, right? So this blue line means there, this is a Bravo Air Space and I'm not allowed to fly in it. So I was, I'm, I'm going to show in the video quickly where I'm going to say uh, Miramar is in sight. We see Miramar. I'm going to level my wings somewhere in this vicinity. I'm going to just roll out from the first right turn, level the wings, and then I'm going to make another right turn. So I use this interstate right here. Uh, I forgot which interstate this is. Looks like either it's the 8 or 52, one of those. But um, I want to make sure that I'm south of this highway to go towards Cows Mountain, which is 1,591. So I'm really climbing real quick because I want to make sure that I'm above 2,400 when I reach this particular space. Because this blue line here means this is another control area. And it's a Delta airspace for Gillespie. And I have to ensure that I'm above 2,400 feet so I don't bust or violate this airspace. So this is my first waypoint. And if I just draw this a little, so I'm going to do something similar to this right here. It's like I'm going to go here first. When I'm like 1,100 feet, then I'm going to make a, a, a first right turn to come around like this. Make sure I stay south of that airport. I mean, airspace, right? So it looks something like that, right? For about a mile, then one turn, and then another turn, and then we come towards that. So let's go back to the video. And when I roll out, you're going to see what I saw that made me like, whoa, this, is, this was not told to me in the weather briefing at all. They said everything was going to be okay. So look what happens next. Let me just full screen that. Alright, so 
right? So there's a turn, first right turn. Then when I see Miramar, I'm gonna level my wings. There it is. All right, Miramar in sight, level the wings. There we go. Clear right, clear left, uh-oh. That's the first sign something is not right. What's happening? Someone didn't tell me that there was haze hey, in the east. Hey. So I'm calling the wife. Hey, hey you there? You, you still on the phone? You hearing hey. me? <laughs> Yeah, she wasn't picking up. She wasn't answering. I mean, she wasn't answering. So I guess she wasn't hearing me at all. So I'm just going to pause here a little bit. There's the interstate I was telling you that I need to stay south off. And this is the runway I just took off. This was the, the where I was rolling down to take off. I was in, in, in this area. And I'm, you know, I'm no pilot. This is downwind leg. When I look to the east, all I can see is this layer of clouds and haze usually on regular days right um you know what oh you know what? i have an idea i'm gonna show you guys um what this actually looks like on a regular day right so i'm gonna just pause the recording right here and then i'm gonna show you what this looks like same thing what it looks like on a regular day when it's not this hazy Alright guys, so this is a solo that I, this was my second solo requirement out to the practice area. I didn't go to another airport, this is just out to the practice area. Look at the big difference where you can clearly see the coastline and what's happening. So it's the same turn that I make all the time. You know, you, you roll out um, to that Miramar airport right here. So I'm going to roll out and then, you know, clear my wings left and right. Look at the difference. You see that? As I'm rolling out, look, I can see everything. You see that? Everything on the, you can see all that. So clear, right? And I'm on downwind leg, right? So parallel to the runway. Alright, so we'll just mute that guy for now. So as you can see, I'm on downwind leg. See, at this point, I will be getting out my chart. I'm getting ready. I'm gonna shoot for this cow's mountain right here, my first waypoint. And I can see these mountain. I can see these houses. Everything is so clear. The visibility is nice. You know, as soon as I come over this mountain, then I'm gonna start going towards Lake Jennings, which is my second waypoint, right? But on this morning's flight look look at this picture just look at it one more time right everything is clear and nice um we're gonna pause that we're gonna pause this one right here now look at oh yeah so we're gonna be right back where i'm gonna show you guys what how how this morning looked look at the difference we don't, I'm not comfortable with the visibility I have right now. Can I come back for landing on Twit right, please? Okay, so pause this right here, right? So this is a defining moment right here. I'm alone. There's no instructor. There's no one for me to um, process this information with I, you know i'm by myself i have two options continue climbing and assume that further ahead it's gonna get better or there's a runway to my right why not just go back and land you know so here's the thing there's in aviation there's what you call the get their itis uh we're gonna google that so you guys can have an idea um what exactly that means so we're gonna do the get their itis and i got a tons of stuff on my screen guys so look what happens right get their itis thing oh it's all spelling caps get their get nah, i didn't spell that right at all get their itist aviation 
information, right? Okay, so let's see if we find anything. It's in the textbook. Let's see if anything online is get there. Okay. Alright, okay, so it's not really showing me. It's a tricky little word, but it's it's not showing me that it's there. So, anyways, uh, the get your right just basically means that, like, in my case, I've been waiting for, like, two months now trying to get this last solar requirement. Oh, it's really what's holding me back these days. And the weather and the winds have been picked up. Like, when the winds are, when the, when the, when the visibility is good, the winds are too high. When the winds are calm, the visibility is poor. You know, there's just always something. There was one point my instructor was on vacation. And when he came back, the chief flight instructor went away for vacation. Before they left, I didn't have the cash to keep training. So, you know, there's always something. Finally, after two months of waiting and doing refresher and all these things, finally, I get to fly and look at the weather that hits me. So at this point, I'm no processing. What do I do? Do I continue or I can I chill. You know what? Uh, forget it. I can fly another day. I'm going to land this airplane, park it, and forget everything happened and just think about safety. So as soon as I make that turn, and this airport can be real busy, I'm using a telling the air traffic controller that I'm a student pilot for specific reasons because I'm going to need help. I go, hey, I'm not comfortable with this visibility that I'm looking at. So that automatically tells him that I'm in a situation where as a student pilot, I can get worked up right now. I can be stressed. I can forget to fly the airplane. The pressure comes in. Um, I can have hyperventilation. I can become fatigued. You know, anything can happen. So when I go, hey, I'm not comfortable with the visibility that I have right now and I want to come back and land, immediately I'm becoming a priority. And so I just went ahead. And really? I cannot continue. Uh, it's too hazy. So here's external pressure. Irene was like, oh, can't you wait? Can I do it later? I go, no, I cannot continue because I'm the one flying. She's at home, just on the phone, earbuds in my ears. I'm the one in this airplane. I'm the one in this situation. It can get ugly. I can fly into these areas and this is instrument conditions where I'm going to have to trust the instruments when I'm a VFR pilot that flies looking outside and I should always see reference to the ground. So anyways, that was a big crucial point for me today in flying today to know that I was able to make a decision real quick and I'm just going to forward the video real quick so you guys can see the landing. Uh, power 1500, below 110, 10 degrees of flaps, efficient for 85 knots. So at this point, I forget cross country and I'm just treating this like a regular pattern work. I'm just practicing landings, forget that I was going to go far for two and a half hours today. Right now, I'm just going to fly the airplane and stay situationally aware and not allow things to get out of control. Take you to the Papa Chad, we're right now. We'll be turning base for the parallel running assessment. Uh, Coverage inside for 2 Papa. I'm just looking back, you know, make sure I constantly have that airport inside. I don't want to go too far. Lights are on, instruments are in the green, and we're turning right base for two way right. Alright, so now we're on base. Just a two two delta fall set right base, runway two way right, clear to go. I know it's clear, runway is clear. And we have that traffic inside. Alright, so now there's a runway 28 right here where I took off from. So I'm just coming into land, making sure you know everything is okay. Then I add my last 30 degrees of flaps. Yeah, so I gotta turn back, it's too hazy. I don't have I don't have 10 miles visibility, even though they're saying that it's 10 miles. So um, 
I'm on final. Yeah, I'm canceling the flight. I don't have the visibility that I need. The mountains are obscure. There's this layer. Anyway, talk to you soon. Um, I'm going to land this plane and park it later. So this is this was another crucial thing to wear. Okay, um, you know I'm flying along and um, I realize okay I'm, I was talking to her the whole time, so I gotta go sterile now. At this point, I don't want to be talking to anyone. I want to focus specifically on my landing. So if you can look here, my vertical speed is showing sixty-five miles. You know, I'm going sixty-five knots. I'm descending like three four three hundred and fifty feet per minute. The elevation is uh, 427 feet, so I still have a little ways to go. So right now I'm on glide slope, I'm coming in nicely, and usually I land on 28 left, which is this one here, and you're going to see what happens because I haven't flown on 28 right for a while. Look what happens next, which is another good aeronautical decision making again. This one is, okay, I'm going to get the wife off the phone, I'm not going to talk to her anymore because I'm going to go stay around and focus on my landing. And look what that resulted in. So coming in, all right, still descending. So I'm like 20 feet, 10 feet above the runway. When I pull the nose up, idle my power, look what's happening. Okay, I'm floating, okay, pull back, floating, floating, floating. There's 2,000 feet left of runway. See, very unstable. I don't like this approach. I'm going around. Full power, retract one natural flaps. When I added the power, I cannot pitch too high because if you look on my airspeed indicator, I'm like 60. So I just told tower I'm going around because, you know, and then, you know, gradually I'm taking out the power as my airspeed increased. When I added that power, if I had like pushed real hard, I mean, pulled real hard or manipulated the controls so aggressively I could inadvertently stall the airplane so I made sure that when I retract my flaps I just barely climb out two three hundred feet per minute and let my air speed build and then keep reducing my flaps so I get out better speed all right, so I'm gonna just pause right here and I'm gonna just show you guys the second approach was way better. I put it on on center line, got off, and it was better. <clears throat> so for time, we're just gonna go straight to the final approach. I right, look, see, so now this approach, I'm 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 more I'm coming in at a steeper angle, so very little power setting. If you look, my power is like maybe 1500. I'm descending at 400 feet per minute. I'm doing like. So I'm doing like 70 knots here, a short final. So I'm, you know, gradually just uh, trying to keep that airspeed as I wanted to. The winds were calm, but for some reason I was just being tossed around left, right, here and there. So I was constantly on my rudders, ailerons, rudders. So notice keeping the nose down, keeping the nose down there, so 65. I maintain 65. I'm aiming for the numbers. Look what happens next. All right, so power coming to idle, bring the nose up, level up. Okay, I'm gonna pause right here. See, the power is idle, right? Power is idle. Then look what look at my vertical speed right here, almost to zero. My airspeed begins to drop significantly. The airport elevation is 427 feet, so this is like I'm like just maybe 10 feet or so from the runway. So it's a very good time where you know, I pretty much had a more stable approach. My nose is level, my wing is level, wings are level. I'm coordinated. If you look at my inchronometer, it's dead on in the center. Look at this. I'm center line at this point, right? So I I I, per, I line the air, the the airport. I mean the runway. I'm lined with center line. There could have been a little more to the right, but no, still a student learning. So nothing crazy. 
and uh, my hand is still on the power throughout the whole time because if anything happens weird i'm gonna push the power and i'm gonna do a go around so look at the round out so wait all right pull the nose up i'm gonna wait for it wait for the sink okay there touchdown right look i'm rolling down center line then i retracted my flaps full back pressure i'm doing a, a short field um landing so I want to get off real quick, so I'm pulling back, full back pressure. Ah, uh, man, okay, so. Alright, so basically no, I'm just um, pretty much taxi in the airplane. I had to cross both runways and no, you know, I'm going back to I'm going back to park the airplane. So, you know, I'm gonna do my after landing checklist. So I got my checklist out and you know, making sure that I trim for takeoff. I'm sending my frequency back to the ground to talk to them to tell them I like to go and park the airplane. I'm turning my strobe lights off, my landing lights should be turned off because at this point, um, the flight is over, you know? And while I'm taxiing back, that's when I begin to just, you know, look back on all that was happening. So there's a portion of it that I want you guys to see um, here and just listen to feedback. The Montgomery Downs have sold set on 7257. Were you able to get my last transit? Yeah, I had both radio set to active here. Were you able to get my last transmission? I think I had both frequencies set to active. 7557, Tango, you want to go back to Tree, right? Uh, negative. We'd like to taxi back to Gibbs for part two. Uh, 5757, Tango, continue. Taxi to Gibbs to your hotel, Juliet. Yeah, I don't think she was hearing me. Ah, so I gotta give a pilot report right now because you see that? Look, if you look if you guys look out, you can clearly see that the mountains are obscure. Like when I climb up, I don't have ten miles visibility, even though they're showing that the visibility is good. I don't have that kind of visibility. Just looking at it, it's not clear. Like at fifteen hundred feet, the ground just disappear with this hazy layer. So if I continue, more than likely three thousand, I'm not gonna be able to see nothing on the ground. Now, if the mountains themselves are obscure, how much more I couldn't see the lake? I I cannot see a mountain so situationally aware I would just not be situationally aware and that could put me in a serious situation so I'm thinking um, when it warms up the weather will be I mean the visibility will be better so I'm gonna go and call flight briefer and give a, a pilot report um, right now so as you can see I'm just taxiing with my uh, so all right, this is where single pilot resource management comes in. Good uh, aeronautical decision making, right? I'm alone in the plane, and I look out, and I don't see the visibility is not what I'm comfortable with. Now, that can get worse. It can go into an IMC conditions, I don't know, you know, or instrument meteorolog meteorological conditions. Anything can happen, so if I see that and I'm in the pattern and I'm used to landing, of course, when I came in, the plane just didn't want to settle down as quick as I wanted it to, so I was in doubt and I wasn't comfortable, so I just did a go around. As my instructor says, you can always go around, so I full power, retract my flaps, and I did a go around. Um, then second one was way better, the plane settled down, the nose shifted, and I was able to correct for that. So, you know, aeronautical decision making is where I've been waiting like what, almost two months now to get this last long cross country solo out of the way. 
and finally I get to go and I see this kind of visibility. I'm not going to play a hero. You can live to fly another day. Uh, come back, park the airplane, because if I push it and something happens, then my pilot license, my whole training is ruined, all because I didn't want to settle down and just call it quits today and try it again uh, tomorrow, you know? So, later on, for those who are, you know, working on their, their private pilot's license or whatever, uh, you just want to bear that in mind. Uh, you just make sure that you make good aeronautical decision making. Um, we have this. Um, there's this external pressure that I was dealing with, but I decided, no, it's not It's not going to get the best of me as much as I really want to go. And as you guys can see, as soon as I reach pattern altitude, I looked out, boom, it's so hazy. I called tower, hey, tower, I'm not comfortable with the visibility. I'm a student pilot, and I'm coming to park this airplane right about now. So um, that was good, and I'm not going no matter what. And... Make sure you guys hit that subscription bar, subscribe, like that video, hit the subscription uh, below, and we'll be more than happy to uh, be glad that I have more subscribers. So right now, we're in the park, wingtip to wingtip, grab my checklist, so avionics.